Thanks for having me, everybody. Thanks for having lunch with me on the fun later. But uh, glad to glad to be here at Duke again to talk about some of the things we're doing over at the um, at Public Health and some of my interests um, in um, in public health. So here's my sort of short outline for today. I'll talk a bit about me. Um, you know, how what is global health? I got some good news and bad news for for you. I'll share. Uh, who are the stakeholders here in this business? Uh, a little bit about money, not too much. Um, what we are at the Global Gateway, and then some of our research interest on falsified and sub-centered medicines. Mike was quite interested in that, so I thought I would spend some time talking about that. But he's quite important to, to be here. I should thank him for, for the invitation. It's uh, a longtime colleague, um, Mike, having been on the board at the Forty Center. Uh, great to have his uh, support. Um, it's a small world, there's a lot to do. Uh, we can't all do it, so we should collaborate and find ways to, to address these big problems we're seeing around the world. Which takes me to my first uh, set of slides here. So I'm from Oklahoma originally. Uh, this is me and my big brother. Uh, my grandparents were Chickasaw Indian. Uh, we came of age in the 1960s, all about science. This is where I got excited about science, watching the moon landing, Neil Armstrong walk in the moon. Uh, I went on to public health. My kid brother John uh, went into uh, become a naval aviator. Uh, so causal association, you know, causation, association, not sort of causation. Well, he wore the glasses. That's probably why he was in uh, <laughs> naval aviation here. Um, I have a penchant for striped shirts, I guess, because this is me wearing my striped shirt in Peace Corps in Senegal. And here I am working with my good friend and colleague, Ida Lowe, who uh, is. Uh, a midwife I worked with when I first started there back in the late 70s, and we've maintained contact ever since, published a bit together, and have seen both of our families' uh, kids uh, grow. So it's great to have these relationships that last probably a lifetime. Uh, in terms of academic stuff, Brian mentioned I went to uh, to a school a number of places, uh, a and my bachelor's in science here at Carolina for my master's in public health. I went to Colorado State, another cultural school for my PhD in environmental epidemiology. I work for Intra Health here in the Triangle. You know about it, it's a big NGO. Uh, back when it was part of the School of Medicine at UNC and helped start their Franklin Homer program. I work for the National Planned Parenthood uh, in the Western Hemisphere region. Uh, I work for CDC for about 17 years as well. So I'm a bit uh, with the Vector Board Disease Lab up in Fort Collins, but uh, most of it actually is working for CDC overseas. And finally, uh, uh, actually, I, part of my CDC tenure was with the United Nations Foundation back when uh, Ted Turner, who started the foundation, was angry at Congress for not paying its arrears that were due to the United Nations. And so he said, well, I'm going to do it myself. I'll pay the billion dollars, and I'll sue Congress to get my money back. <laughs> and the lawyer said, you can't sue Congress. And the uh, UN said, thanks, Mr. Turner. We can't take the money from an individual. Um, so he said, well, I'll do it anyway, and created this foundation, and he did it help on the children's health portfolio, a grant portfolio, so I spent five years there helping uh, Mr. Turner and uh, Senator Worth, uh, who was directing the foundation, spend his billion dollars, and it was really quite interesting time. The thing I learned there, actually, that probably I didn't appreciate coming in with a science background is that science doesn't make a lot of difference. Politics <laughs> So I can talk about malaria, I can talk about the burden of disease, but you know, if it didn't make a big difference to the UN, then Mr. Turner wasn't going to spend his money on it. So he had to find political ways and arguments to, to get the grant money out the door. And finally, I worked at NIH um, most recently before coming here to, um, to Carolina, uh, where I was in the uh, Portman International Center and directed there. Uh, at Division of International Relations, which put me in contact with people from all over the world, delegations wanting to see what the gold standard was for biomedical and behavioral research on campus at NIH. So, uh, long-term assignments, I've been in Senegal, where I started out as a volunteer, stayed on and worked with USAID, went to Haiti with IDPF for the Western Minister region, uh, worked in Cote d'Ivoire for CDC, and I was the director of the uh, national program for CDC in, in Nigeria as well. About a third of my career has been spent in this sort of international context. So what is global health? I like to use uh, former CDC Director Copeland's um, definition in that it is a, an area of study, research, and practice 
that places them priority on improving health and achieving equity. And I, I'll come back to that later. Um, in health for people uh, worldwide. It's transnational, looking at these health issues, it looks at determinants and solutions, it involves a lot of disciplines, it's an interdisciplinary uh, effort, it requires that kind of collaboration. That's one reason why I'm here talking to you all at Duke. And I'm coming from Carolina, I really believe in this need for interdisciplinary collaboration. Uh, basketball and sports <laughs> things, metaphors aside, this is, this is serious business. Um, and it's really about the synthesis of population-based population -based prevention, which is what public health is, and individual clinical care, because you have to take care of the individual patient. So this is, I like this definition that, that Jeff Copeland and colleagues put together in the last in 2001. So the good news, the good news is that in the world, we're making great progress on a number of fronts. So here's some data from the World Health Report, the Disease Control Parties Project, and the Institute of Health Metrics up in Seattle, I've just put these in some pie charts to show you the distribution of reported mortality by cause. So you can see that in the world, about seven billion people, uh, most of the mortality is driven by non-communicable diseases. That's really no surprise. 10% on injuries, and about a third or less on infectious maternal conditions. Uh, in the region of Americas, uh, you can see even a greater proportion of mortality is driven by non-communicable uh, by contrast, in the Africa region, uh, over two-thirds of mortality is driven by infectious diseases still. Uh, and I'll show you what that looks like here. For the Africa region, if you break out that slice of the pie, that two-thirds, you can see that the majority of it um, is by, uh, driven by HIV and malaria, uh, with uh, the rest being tuberculosis, uh, diarrheal diseases, of course, uh, the immunizable diseases, and so on. But really, over half the burden of mortality in Africa is driven by parasitic uh, infections and HIV. If you um, take out the HIV slice of that pie, what remains? You can see that it's parasitic and, and, and infectious diseases by far. And I'm going to drive, build out a, a bit on that when we uh, talk about malaria uh, later on. So uh, here's the good news. We made progress on malaria. Well, this is Anopolis mosquito. She's taken a blood meal. She uses her very sensitive antennae and receptors to pick up those CO2 molecules in the air that are floating around as you're exhaling. Follow those into to where you are and uses uh, heat sensing devices to know what the heat is, uh, where the heat is, zeroing in on that, and use, using those big eyes to find a nice place to take that uh, blood meal and using her proboscis to draw up blood that may contain uh, malaria parasites and other uh, com uh, other uh, agents of disease. <clears throat> Only females do this. Males are their favorite nectar. Uh, they're not the, uh, but why does she do this actually? Why is she drawing uh, a blood? What's, what's the reason she's searching out for blood? It's an evolutionary issue. She needs the protein in the blood to create her eggs so that she can perpetuate the species. So that's why uh, they look for this, this blood to get that protein out of the egg. So what's the burden of the disease look like around the world? Uh, for malaria, what you can see is primarily in Africa and in South Asia, Southeast Asia. We have a large number of confirmed cases based on the WHO report from 2010. What are we doing in prevention and treatment for malaria? There's some really great tools. This is why I'm giving you good news that we've had some success. Uh, these long-lasting insecticide-treated bed nets here have reduced all-cause mortality since they've been reduced by about 20% and under-5 mortality by over, almost 50%. Uh, residual, residual indoor spraying, you can see here, um, spraying a little bit of a DDT-like compound, or DDT in some cases, that prevents this monopoly's mosquito from resting on the walls at night to then go in and feed on individuals who are not <coughs> And here are these nets that are treated with this uh, woven into the fiber uh, is this insecticide that keeps the mosquitoes from alighting or, or actually killing them because it's insecticidal and preventing them from uh, getting that blood yield that, that she so much needs. So when I was a volunteer in this village, this is the family I lived with. This is my son's photo he took when we visited back in 2005. Uh, I had a bed net like that, but it didn't have anything on it. It was just a barrier. So if you're like me and you roll on at night, you know, and you put your arm up against the bed net, well, the mosquitoes just can go through there and feed and get a great blood meal for me because there's no reason the barrier wasn't sufficient to keep their proboscis out of the uh, net and getting that blood meal. So with this uh, woven-in treatment, it makes a big difference. 
And I'll show you here why. In Rwanda, for, for instance, this is data from the President's Malaria Initiative, you can see that as uh, 2000, these are on the uh, y axis over on the left, you can see deaths per 100,000 population quite high, 20 up to 30, up to 32 or so. Um, and then when nets were introduced in 2005, this sort of gray area is LLIN coverage, long-lasting insecticide-treated nets. When it went up to you know, over 50%, you began to see this reduction in malaria deaths as a result. So this is the uh, real evidence, that one example in Rwanda where these nets have made a huge difference in mortality. Well, here's the bad news. The bad news is that we're living longer. You can see here from this chart, Way back to 1550, that the average lifespan for individuals in the UK about the time of one of the plagues was around 35 years old. Uh, but over time, we have uh, increased our longevity, life expectancy at birth, to where now about 85% of Japanese will live to be 85 years old. And that's continuing throughout the world, uh, except for uh, places where you have uh, HIV or the recent Ebola outbreak, but generally the trend is upward in terms of life expectancy. So that's actually bad news. The bad news is because there are these changes that are occurring. These changes in demography, the changes in uh, epidemiology, uh, economic and social transitions are occurring as illustrated here by the economists cover. So what does this look like in terms of mortality? and non-communicable diseases in Africa. The small slice of that pie I showed you earlier. Well, again, it's very much like the rest of the world, where you have cancers, other than neoplasms, and cardiovascular disease uh, showing the greater proportion of mortality in the African region. So what does this mean? Uh, it means that the trends that we're seeing elsewhere in the world, where you have very high rates of obesity, over 30% obesity in the U.S., in Mexico, parts of South America, South Africa, certainly in the Middle East, that's going to be coming, that's the tsunami that's coming to places in the developed world if trends continue in terms of economic development. If the transitions that I, I showed you earlier are to continue, these, these conditions will arise in places where they aren't currently. And that's the concern if you're in public health and clinical care, you have to be aware of looking at how can we address this, get ahead of the curve. And why is that? Well, this is some of the things that we're exporting from the developed world. We're exporting kinds of foods, such as the Burger King stacker here. I know everyone's had lunch, but I don't see any Burger King stackers in the room, so it must be pretty healthy stuff here. And do the uh, this this I'm not just picking up Burger King, I'm illustrating using this uh, illustration. Um, to uh, drive home the point that these products uh, contain a lot of calories. I think we only need 2,000 calories a day, and this is half of that amount in this one meal. High amounts of fat, saturated fat, cholesterol, and sodium. It's cheap, it tastes good, and it's everywhere. It's everywhere in the emerging economy, certainly in Asia. <laughs> it's also because of what's occurring with sugary beverages, for example. And as you recall, a few years ago, former Mayor Bloomberg here, the pop cop, was trying to restrict king-size colas from being sold in New York City because his concern is that it's leading to obesity, leading to obesity in a direct relationship. He wasn't successful from a legal point of view, but he's still putting his money behind this in terms of research to support efforts of changing policy around the world, just like he is with tobacco. Tobacco is the other big export that we, for instance, here in North Carolina, you know, a big uh, economic crop back when I was a graduate student here in the 80s. Not so much anymore because it's been exported by those companies around the world, uh, getting young women particularly addicted to the fashion sort of uh, nonsense that they associate with uh, tobacco and uh, becoming addicted uh, behavior. So tobacco exports, food exports, sugary beverage exports, that sort of, sort of bad augmentation, if you will, is what's occurring in uh, the developing world coming from us in the developed world. Same thing with behaviors that are being exported associated with alcohol, consumption of, uh, of beer, uh, again, tobacco here in the case of uh, behavioral addiction, and Homer being addicted to, uh, to sugar, either because his family may be at a lot of donuts, or maybe he has some genetic predisposition. It's a concern we have to, we have to address. Is that what's driving 
sugar addiction in Homer. The environment also is driving what we're seeing in terms of the global mortality of, uh, of disease uh, in non-communicable diseases. Here's the case from Bangladesh where the water is contaminated with naturally occurring arsenic, which causes arsenicosis, which in immediate uh, <laughs> stages uh, causes sort of this um, calcification of the planter surfaces of the hands and feet. Um, and to address that, they measured in these uh, tube wells that were installed back in the late 70s, early 90s by USAID and UNICEF and other development agencies in order to reduce the burden of disease caused by diarrhea that was, that was associated with consumption of water contaminated by viruses, uh, parasites, and bacteria. Well, uh, you got clean water, but you got clean water with a consequence. The consequence was that it actually has naturally occurring arsenic in it that's been deposited over millennia off the Himalaya mountains. And when it's exposed to water, it has a uh, redox uh, reaction that releases that arsenic in a free form that when it's consumed by individuals results in arsenicosis. So this is the short-term effects of arsenicosis. The long-term effects are lung cancer and bladder cancer. And so it's not just in Bangladesh, it's around the world that the environment actually poses a great hazard to individuals and drives that non-communicable diseases component of mortality that I was describing earlier. So who are the stakeholders in this business we call global health? Well, I've given this sort of seven or six categories, uh, both lateral organizations, international groups, like the WHO, uh, UNICEF, uh, GAVI, Mobac, Malaria. Countries, individual countries are involved in this as well. The private sector, of course, the foundations, the businesses, um, individuals are certainly involved who are affected by these conditions or want to see change take place. Civil society is very important in this engagement as well, and the NGOs are captured in that category. And here in academia and research organization, we find ourselves here at Duke, at UNC, at NC State, and others trying to address these problems in global health. So here are 15 different sort of milestones, if you will, that occurred kind of when I, since I got into business. Back in 78, when there was this WHO declaration of health for all by the world, to, by the year 2000. Health for all by the year 2000. Uh, I think we're about 15 years late so far in meeting that goal that was declared. But that's not to say it wasn't a bad declaration. It's, a, it's actually a laudable declaration because we want to have health for all. We want to have universal health coverage. And I think that is the start of when that actually started, when that was actually announced in Almaty, Kazakhstan, or the former Soviet Union back in 78. Smallpox was eradicated uh, in the late 70s and, um, and announced in 80. A universal um, declaration for water, clean water in 1980. Polio eradication began in the late 80s, Millennium Development Goals in 2000. The Global Fund began in 2002, PEPFAR, President's Plan, or Emergency Plan for Aging Relief in 2003, President's Malaria Initiative, very important, but huge investments in global health that we've never seen before in, in public health. These are fantastic investments that were made by President Bush's administration. And some would argue those are very important, obviously, to public health, but they were done actually as an offset to starting a war. So if you have a war, you need to have some counterbalance in that politically, and that was uh, one argument as to why those were actually invested with in, in such high investments. The uh, NTD's uh, action by um, USA, cut part being reauthorized, the Global Health Initiative launched in 2009, and then sort of transformed into the Global Health Diplomacy Initiative, which is sort of stuttering along. These are sort of initiatives that administrations uh, put in place, the Obama administration that has had some traction, I wouldn't say personally, uh, Great, great success, although it sort of elevated the issue of diplomacy in global health, which is an important, important area. Uh, PEPFAR was extended again, and then PMI was extended, and now we have the sustainable development goals were adopted or being adopted this past week by the UN General Assembly. So what's next for us in, in global health? I'll ask, I'll ask you to ponder that. Uh, on money, where is the money flowing in global health? This comes again from the Institute of Health Metrics in Seattle. Chris Murray's group, you can see here that in 1990, the majority of funding was coming from other governments that was going to sort of other health focus areas and maternal health to a certain extent, child health, swaps, uh, structural adjustment programs, a little bit of malaria, very little non communicable diseases. Um, but other governments, the United States, France, 
there's really the private philanthropy is very small back in the 1990s. That's all changed now. I mean, this is the latest data they have on their website, which you should use if you're looking to find out where's the money flowing, because it's really a nice um, uh, way to triage and sort of filter out based on what your interests are. Again, so the United States has moved up quite high, actually, as a source of funding, mainly going to HIV, some to malaria, some sort of sprinkled amongst these other uh, uh, health focus <coughs> areas. The Gates Foundation, again, France, much less than previously. Other governments, much less than, than previously in 1990. Uh, and UK government with some greater emphasis coming from private philanthropy. Just sort of a snapshot in two points in time as to the flows of global health finance and that you find of interest. So let's go to the Gilling School of Global Public Health and talk about what we're doing there, what we're about, why we think global health is local health. This is sort of this mantra that we talk about, and I did a nice article on that, uh, why that's important to us. Well, I just want to illustrate to you why this, I think, is important. Uh, I'm a private pilot. I like to fly small planes for my avocation. And I just thought I'd uh, show you some of the websites that I like to look at. Uh, here is a site of what looks like, point in time, the number of average commercial flights daily around the world. Over 100,000 commercial flights daily around the world. It's kind of astounding, actually, to think about. There's people traveling back and forth, you know, um, and to have this all mapped out. Here in the U.S., from FlightAware, these are all planes, commercial planes above, the, both in case, both cases above 30,000 feet. This is not small planes like I fly. These are big planes that I can't fly. Uh, but you can see there's a lot of them out there. Uh, and that is why, uh, one illustration of why global health is local. People traveling, moving with them, various agents of disease that could infect others and uh, vice versa. So at the school, what are we doing? We're trying to look at the future, uh, looking at accelerating public health solutions. We've been in operation for about 75 years. This is our 75th birthday uh, this year. Uh, we're in all 100 counties. Uh, faculty, staff, and students have worked with over 400 North Carolina partners about 9,000 participants uh, each year to address these public health problems to protect and promote the health of North Carolinians because we're our state and university. We're about North Carolina. This should be our priority. We looked at uh, preventing childhood obesity, something I mentioned earlier that's um, uh, driving the, uh, the burden of mortality uh, uh, from non diseases through the knapsack program with preschoolers, trying to reduce uh, dates of, uh, rates of death for breast cancer, uh, disparities that exist between white and black women in North Carolina. Uh, we support dozens of student internships and practicas and capstone projects each year in North Carolina. And 13 of Carolina's 39 graduate impact awards went to UNC Gilling students in 2013. And one example of this in terms of industry, we're trying to find ways to dispose of the 40 million gallons of hog waste produced in North Carolina uh, each day. So what does it look like? A snapshot of the school itself. Uh, this is from, I think, fall, maybe two years ago, but it's pretty much the same as if some of the numbers have changed slightly. Basically, we have these eight departments, biostatistics, epidemiology, environmental sciences, and engineering, health behavior, which is my department where I have my appointment now, health policy and management, maternal and child health, nutrition, and public health, uh, the public health leadership program. About 7, 15 to 1,700 students on any given day, uh, some 238 faculty, 300 and so permanent staff, um, 35,000 hours of teaching, 75 academic programs, about $150 million in uh, research awards um, each year, again, practicing in all 100 North Carolina counties. We have this sort of menu of uh, degrees that are offered at the school from the PhD um, to the Master's in Environmental Engineering and the Bachelor's in Public Health with some certificates and continuing education that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, about 93% uh, 90, of our grads get a job or go on to study after they graduate, which is, uh, which is great. And our alums have become leaders across uh, the state and uh, around the world. I just uh, got the data the other day for our bachelor's program in uh, public health at the school. Uh, it's about uh, 214, I think, that are registered for this fall. And these are the programs, uh, the departments in the school that have a bachelor's program, biostatistics, environmental uh, health, nutrition, and health policy and management. You can see health policy management has the, the sort of lion's share of the uh, 
you know, the bachelor's students at UNC. You asked me this question live early and I couldn't answer it, but now I've done my due diligence and I've answered my question. So where do the grads go when they get jobs from UNC? This is sort of a snapshot of all the places they go, including here at Duke Medicine, uh, NIH, CDC, RTI, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, Print Tiles. Um, the majority go to industry, some go back to university, uh, some to government like me, where I spent you know, a good part of my career with CDC and NIH, and then to the nonprofit NGO. Is that graduates and undergraduate students? That's actually a good question. I don't know. I mean, by it's about, you know, grads, undergrads are only about 12% uh, of the population of students at the school, so by far it's the graduate students that this is representing. But that's actually a good question, so I'll work on that one next. Were you surprised <laughs> at the industry number? You know, actually not. I think that's really quite, uh, if you consider industry to be um, quintiles, IBM, Johnson Johnson, I mean, these are, these are private, you know, private industry. NGOs would be like, you know, RTI, IntraHealth, and so on. So the gateway, what is the gateway? Well, we were started back uh, when the gift was made to the school by um, Dennis and Joan Gillings, um, and there was an exercise put together to try to create an office that would really do what the name says, Global Public Health, we're trying to put that into place. And so they set up this um, task force to go through and examine what do they want to do. They want to do high impact public health partnerships with governments, private sector, nonprofits, academia, to look at using implementation science to turn real world strategies and transform lives. <coughs> Take these unique strengths of the healing school globally in research, teaching, and public service, and then of course training the next generation of public health leaders. So things that I'm working on to try to do this, I'm implementing what this task force report has put forward. I've been told I need to be nimble and action oriented. Uh, it's really hard to do in a state uh, institution where you're held by state rules uh, coming from the government. Uh, actually, the good news is that um, it wasn't a government shutdown for the feds, but when I was in the government as a federal employee, the government shut down, you couldn't work. You know, After September 30th, there, there was no budget. Where here, even if there was there wasn't a budget, you know, by the state legislators, they didn't pass a budget until a week or two ago. We can continue to work, which is really good news because uh, as a Fed, not being able to work on your projects and have to shut down everything, uh, very very frustrating. So I guess the good news is we are somewhat more nimble here in state of North Carolina than at the federal level. Um, being faculty and student centered, uh, students for me are the reason I'm here. Uh, I want students to achieve. I want them to learn. I want them to take this knowledge and information and put it into practice. And I want them to you know, help build these new internal systems for us at the school so we can have these strong, strong partnerships. So some of the things we've done recently, Pamela Collins from uh, National Institute of Mental Health came down and talked to us about mental health. Hugely important but underrepresented area in our investment at the school. This is something we're talking about. Should the school get involved in greater emphasis on mental health, uh, global mental health. And Pamela is a great example of taking the National Institute of Mental Health program and putting a global stamp on it. She's just done fantastic work at NIMH and making grant monies available for that purpose. Um, we had Joel Bremen and others come down for, uh, he's actually here for our Falsified Medicines press conference that I'll talk about later. But you know, Joel here, you see Joel, this is the young Joel, uh, was here to talk about his career in uh, public health, along with some other folks from around the world, including one in school, uh, uh, Oxford uh, and University of Ottawa, folks representing those, those institutions. Uh, so students can hear about what was it like to be on the first Ebola outbreak investigation. He tells a great story, which I'm not gonna, uh, you can read about it actually in several books. He's, he's, he's beat on a number of, uh, of books and some some uh, some movies, but um, that's something we thought the students should hear about. So trying to bring in these these luminaries like Joel, who are humble, but you have done a lot to uh, to help us understand the global health context and how do you work in environments like the global desire. Is that Peter Piot and that? Oh uh, yes, it is actually. It's Peter Piot said as well. Uh, so last week we had Ted Trouble come down from the National Cancer Institute. Um, uh, who is the director for their Center for Global Health, talk about uh, global oncology, what does that mean for us? Again, this is addressing uh, what I mentioned earlier in terms of the global burden of disease driven by non-communicable uh, diseases. Uh, just past weekend, uh, 
the undergrads actually in the health policy and management department have put on for the second year a World Health Assembly, a mock World Health Assembly. Uh, and I think there were some folks from Duke, anyone who here attend that this, this past weekend? There were undergrads from Duke that actually attended this on uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Um, to help them understand what does it take to drive, to change policy through the WHO system. Everyone was assigned a country. I was representing, I wasn't representing anybody, but if I was there, I would have been representing, say, Vietnam, or they were assigned countries, they had their regions, they had to work out a resolution in their region and present that re resolution to the full membership, defend their uh, questions uh, that were presented to them using Robert's Rules of Order, which is great because people actually respect it. They did a great job in, in putting this together. So that's not something that the undergrads have done uh, at, uh, at UNC Gillings. And this is going to move around, I guess, the country uh, uh, next year and be posted by other, other universities. Uh, and just yesterday, we had a, a learning symposium on um, opportunities and challenges and conflict settings and complexes, complex emergencies, where we had presenters, uh, including the vice minister from Liberia, um, uh, one of my former staff from NIH, uh, Gavin Smith from the uh, Urban and Planning Department, who leads the Department of Homeland Security here, and uh, Veronique. Um, um, uh, Erbniak from uh, the International Committee of the Red Cross talk about the, the challenges and opportunities in working in complex emergencies, obviously a very important issue in public health around the world. So uh, a bit about what we're trying to do here with our vision for global learning, school of choice, migrant student exchanges, and globalized curriculum. I'll just touch a bit on that. We have some MPH tracks here that are uh, designed for leaders, uh, people that are currently in uh, mid-career, both residential and online. We have a new global online MPH that's accredited. And we have an occupational health nursing degree that's residential and online, and healthcare and uh, prevention uh, MPH track that is residential. And we have these certificate programs that you may know about that are also available in core concepts, public health leadership, global health, uh, and field epidemiology. What's the impact we want to have? Well, we're going to have, and I didn't get the names right here because I had a cheat sheet about uh, who these folks are. So uh, this is Alice Wang. Uh, she's um, a 2513 graduate, uh, PhD graduate, who co-founded Auckland Gen X. It's a social enterprise formed around research conducted under the Gillings Innovation Lab. The Gillings also gave a bonus of money that is uh, let out by competitive um, uh, process to faculty at the school roughly $150,000 each um, for funding uh, through the Gillings Global Innovation Labs. Um, and this is an example of, of what she's done. Uh, this young guy uh, produced a prototype of a field deployable version of a unique human lung cell air sampling system with this lab um, innovation uh, funding. Then Ralph Barrick is looking at low cost, multivalent, and stable vaccines against respiratory viruses that affect young children. So these are the kind of things we're going to do, scale these up, and have uh, folks be change makers uh, around the world. All right, so I'm going to shift now to some of the work I'm doing on falsified and substandard medicines using malaria as a case in point. Uh, again, this is just a snapshot of the number of people at risk, uh, cases and deaths, most of them occurring in Africa, uh, disproportionately affecting under five years old. You know, the news is that it's preventable and treatable, as I described earlier. Economic costs are huge uh, in Africa uh, as a result of malaria, but because of political commitment and expanded funding, we've reduced incidence by about a third uh, globally um, and in Africa between 2000 and 2012. <coughs> There's a slide from our malariologist, Steve Meshnik, at the school who researches this from Namayimo Hospital in uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, where not enough beds kids being treated uh, for malaria. Again, the tools I mentioned before, I'm going to focus on artificial accommodation therapy here as an example for falsified substandard medicines. Uh, it's a Chinese herbal remedy that's been around for thousands of years. It was announced in China as being anti-malarial back in 72 and began to be introduced globally in the 1990s. Uh, as you heard on the news on Monday, uh, Dr. Tu Yu Yu uh, was the scientist from China who was awarded the Nobel Prize in Medicine for her work on identifying the compound in uh, Artemisia, Artemisia annua, which is the plant sweet wormwood that was, had parasitical effects. 
I took this from Alibaba's website. If I was going to buy some art of this, then what would it cost me? Uh, and if I'm buying it from Vietnam, I think the uh, trade on board price was about 600 to 800 US dollars per kilogram. And you have to order a minimum of five kilograms. Right, so why is this important? Well, it is directly resulting in reduced mortality. Use of Artemis in combination therapy. A couple of examples here. Um, you know, this is our uh, mortality rate that's been estimated. We can see that with the introduction of ACTs, as they go up, mortality is going down over time. Why is this? This, this is really good news for us. Um, however, the supply side of this, because it's a natural product that has not yet been synthesized, note to self, if you're interested in synthesizing Artemis, you would probably want to know more prize yourself. If you can do that, it grows slowly, about 18 months for the plant to produce a um, enough active, active ingredient in the leaves, which take a lot of leaves to create this. Uh, there's not enough supply in the world to meet the demand. And why uh, is that a concern for us in falsified medicines? Well, there's a demand. There's a demand that is leading to illegal market and fake anti-malarial drugs. Some examples of this uh, that we've worked on, and by the way, I have copies of the, uh, of the journal here. If you are really interested in this, you want to read about it, and uh, it addresses this uh, in detail, where we try to understand how to detect fake drugs, how to understand what is the epidemiology of these drugs, and what are some policy recommendations that we can use to address the problem. I interviewed with a writer from Newsweek back in June. She said, this will never make it past my editors. And then she called me and said, we're on the cover of Newsweek <laughs> about this issue, not just about antimalarials, but other drugs around the world because I put around to some people who are authors in our supplement here and gave them great information. So I'm going to play a short clip here of something that we are looking at um, and why this is a concern. I'm supposed to wait one second for him to put this on. A million people around the world die each year from taking counterfeit medications. That's according to estimates from the World Health Organization. Pakistan, just one of the countries where making and selling fake pills and potions is a bustling market.
इस्तेमाल करने देते हैं उसकी वजह यह है कि अच्छी दवाई नहीं है तो बस यही मसला है बहुत अगर हम आम लोगों के पेशेंट को धोखा देने वाली बात है सबसे बड़ा नुकसान उसका ये होता है कि वो उस लेवल पे इफेक्ट नहीं देती कि मरीज ठीक हो जाए उसका इलाज हो जाए not those that are degraded because they leave the factory in poor shape or they have poor storage, those that are due to neglect, negligent um, factory error, but those that are intentionally falsified. It's a big problem that WHO is beginning to uh, focus on through its wrap up work system. Pfizer gave us data that showed that between 20, uh, 2008 and 2014, the number of countries that had falsified drugs in their system of surveillance from 75 to 107, products jumped from uh, 29 to 69, and they had supply chain breaches in uh, 25 countries in 2008, 60, 2014, and medicine types, eight in 2008, and that six year period jumped to 26. PubMed, we looked at data coming from PubMed on fake drugs. Back in 1966, there were like 27 articles. Between 2010 and 2015, that jumped uh, tenfold to almost 300. These sites are terrible. You can see here an example on the right of a counterfeit manufacturing site. This is an authentic Pfizer site that they provided these photos to us. Here are examples of fake holograms and fake pills on the left. Which hologram do you think is authentic? It's hard to tell, isn't it? That's the authentic one. Here it's actually written. You can see the one on the right is authentic, although it looks, to my eye, rougher and less shiny than the one on the left. So I would have chosen the one on the left. Would you? It looks better. It looks cleaner, but actually it isn't. Again, thanks to John Paul Clark from Pfizer for letting us use these, these photos from their system. This problem has been identified in the journals and New England Journal of Medicine and The Lancet from publications that we've worked on with colleagues from Southeast Asia. Avastin, you may have heard about this in 2012, the injectable anti-cancer drug, uh, is also recently reviewed by Tim Mackey, one of our authors in the supplement, who has looked, has looked at the problem of Avastin and asked, what have we learned since that injectable cancer drug actually infiltrated our genuine supply uh, chains in the US? Again, ways that you can look at this, uh, and I'll just point out here, sort of tier one are the inspectors, uh, tier two are the uh, uh, types of devices you can use, and I'll show you one of those was from FDA, and then sort of the chemical analysis. Here's the FDA device. It uses LEDs of different wavelengths to show both on packaging and pills, how you can distinguish between the authentic on the right in that lower left frame, and the top in the um, lower right frame not with the non-invasive, uh, comparing with the original uh, product. Here are more invasive techniques using dissolution and colometric reactions, where you have to actually uh, use the uh, counterfeit pills themselves and uh, look at them in, in various techniques. This is published by Mike Green and CBC in their work. Compounded uh, drugs, these injectable steroids that came before in 2012 as well, that led uh, President Obama to uh, issue the track and trace law called the Drug Quality and Security Act in order to uh, actually find ways to uh, follow these products from uh, manufacturer to patient. Here in the research triangle, uh, Citrix uh, Cert IX, uh, Certi RX is a company here in the triangle that makes this very interesting looking barcode like product but has a unique labeling process that can actually use, be used with iPhones um, or smartphones that will allow you to detect if there has been any change made to that label, to that 
Uh, so it's actually counterfeit proof is what they say. And this is an example that he gave us from a talk he gave that uh, you would see a few months ago. So what are the, what are the solutions? This is my last two slides to wrap up. Solutions are that if 40% of our drugs and 80% of our APIs for drugs in the United States are imported, and that many countries have inadequate laws that make it actually uh, a good investment to be a fake drug manufacturer, we should do the same thing the FAA does. We should, if you're gonna land your Air India, Air China, uh, or Air ABC country plane in the US, you have to follow FAA regulations for safety, for inspections. That's not the case now with our importation of drugs and active pharmaceutical ingredients for drugs. Solutions include getting consensus on definitions, scalable research and technology, global leadership, having oversight on deficient manufacturing and regulatory challenges in China and India. Particularly, uh, India exports about $15 billion worth of products in the pharmaceutical industry to the US. And having a national, international convention, much like the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, and national legislation template, which Amir Adaran at the University of Ottawa was actually made available. He's gone through and written a model law that would could be used by countries in developing their own law on medicine crime. And that's a very good So I just want to say thanks, Mike, for having me out. Glad to have talked to you all. And of course, I couldn't leave without showing you. <laughs> People watching online, I didn't say hello, but uh, I'm on. And I'm on. <laughs> okay, so I'm happy to take questions. Uh, any thoughts you have about uh, things I've said? I just wonder on the drugs. I, what I've read a lot about this is it's most, more and more of this is online. Yes. Which makes it, I don't see how you're going to control this because, I mean, I was reading the Russians have started a big, big business now. Of course, you mentioned a lot of the other countries, but how do you get it, something like this, when so much of this is online? Right. You just go online, order it, it's shipped to your home, yeah. or, where, or, your, or where you, I mean, it, the control is going to be really hard in those settings. You know, I, um, I bet Amazon will be doing it. <laughs> it's, it's tough, you know, it's tough. They, uh, you have, it's, price, is, price drives people where to make their purchases. So if you have very expensive drugs, like artemisinin, or like a cancer drug, and you want a lower price drug, you look for other sources. And if those sources are illegitimate, and they, but they look legitimate online, you go online. And it's hard for postal inspectors to keep up with this inflow of boxes and boxes and bins and bins of packaging coming in from Canada, for instance. And the laws are weak, the laws are weak. So you can, you can develop a, a website in Canada, but if you don't sell to Canadians, you only sell outside Canada, you can't be prosecuted based on Canada, Canadian land. In Netherlands, you can sell a freight drug. Um, you have to sell it twice, though, to be in prison. The first time, it's sort of an administrative excuse. You know, you're excused. And this is a very weak uh, regulatory and judicial frameworks. And that's one thing we really stress in this supplement that that has to be strengthened. But I wouldn't buy, and I would suggest no one buy, their uh, pharmaceuticals uh, from an internet pharmacy, even supplements. But, you know, supplements are probably worse because there is no regulation of supplements. You know more about what's in that can of Coke, that Coke or a piece of bread, than you know about what's in a dietary supplement because there's no requirements. Other thoughts, just the back. Can I go back to the first half of your talk yes. and ask you to think, talk about um, strategies for international students in education? So what sort of vision do you have? Do you see training students through online overseas? Do you See that mix with bringing international students here and what are the challenges? Yeah, there's a couple of ways we're looking at that. The school, certainly the online focus is a really strong suit of the school. They have, in fact, I met a number of students who are in the Doctorate in Public Health, a non-residential program. I think it's a two-year program that, maybe it's three years actually. Uh, I'm sorry, no, I, it's a long program. It's not like a nine-month program. Um, and I met them, and they were from all over the world. I met a, a fellow from Nigeria. There are three CDC employees who are stationed around the world, uh, one in Haiti, I think, one in Uganda, uh, another somewhere else in Africa that are actually participating in this online DRPH. They're mid-career professionals. They want to increase their understanding and knowledge and practice abilities. And these online programs are not sort of trivial cakewalks. 
I asked a couple of students who have taken this uh, program, and they were like, this is much more rigorous, rigorous than I ever expected. So the online, it looks like to us anyway, it is a uh, way to go for those types of individuals who want that extra training. In terms of individuals coming here, I think we'd like to see more folks coming to the U.S. to, um, to study at UNC or at any U.S. institution to get the great training that they, they could. Um, a couple of areas that confront them, though, are um, getting the appropriate funding and uh, visa in order to be here. Uh, staying here if they uh, are on a student visa uh, is a challenge for some, certainly for postdocs. At postdocs at NIH, there was concern that uh, for them, if they went outside the U.S., back home, and they are on uh, whichever visa they had, uh, they may have difficulty coming back. And that was a concern for them. And that's, you know, from my family perspective, I think that's, um, that can be very challenging for international students. Uh, so just a couple of thoughts on, on that. I think we'd like to see more international students. Funding's an issue, and um, giving our own students the experience is also for us a big challenge as well. Trying to find the resources to pay for these uh, students to have that uh, summer uh, externship or be engaged in a research project uh, field site is hugely important, it's hugely beneficial, but you know that requires resources, and that's something that's difficult to come by. Just, yes. just to follow up on that, you, you talked about online courses and programs for degree students. Do you do any online education for non-degree students or more executive education? Um, you know, I think the certificate programs are, are limited to, um, well, actually, I don't know. I, I, honestly, I'm still learning the system here at UNC, and I apologize for not knowing the details about our, our different programs. But um, they do have the certificate programs for students who want to have extra information, extra credit to get the certificate as an MPH student, for instance. As an add-on. Yes, as an add-on. I think if you have extra credits, they get the certificate by following what's required. What do they offer those outside a uh, degree program? Uh, can I just have one more question? I don't know, maybe you haven't been there long enough, but we were struck when the word global got named to the title of the school. And so we've been wondering what changed. We have a lot of graduates in the audience here. I'm wondering what, what you know yet from being there, what, when the global was added, apropos the questions you're getting, mm -hmm. what changed? Did they change the educational programs or the way they brought in international students or did they teach? make more opportunities for faculty and just we never we, we never could understand what we were delighted but we didn't right. know what it meant right I didn't either when I saw it as an alum you know what does that mean what are you gonna do you know well they hired me for one thing <laughs> so it's my job to figure that out to answer your question you know find more opportunities for faculty so there's sort of three things I'm doing one is to know what are we doing how do we map out what faculty are working on what where in the world which is a bit of a challenge you know with a with the state system for research that they have in place we did this at NIH and because Francis Collins wanted to know where are we spending our money, you saw that through our World Report program. Great map, you can see where NIH is investing its resources around the world, along with a number of other biomedical institutions. Um, same thing, I'm trying to do the same thing at, at UNC to map that out. Uh, finding grant opportunities for faculty, a lot of faculty use um, uh, the Community of Science Pivot as a way to learn about what's being out there as far as funding opportunities. It may not have the full complement of the smaller foundations, smaller groups that may have funding. I uh, brought a lot of those with me from our uh, work at NIH because we got the same question from people who couldn't get NIH grants. Where do I go to get my potential funding? So getting faculty those opportunities. And again, for students, knowing where students have had their practica, mapping that out, using those students to talk to other students who are currently uh, enrolled to know how did it go for them? What did they learn? Would you recommend it? Uh, that's something that we're trying to build as well, communication between students uh, who are currently in programs and those who have matriculated. So a couple of, you know, three different ways I'm trying to approach the question you've asked. We have time for one more question. Uh, hi, Jim. Melissa Watt. I'm faculty here and also yes. a double UNC alum, um, undergrad, and my PhD from a multi major. Great. Um, it was great to hear. I appreciate that you started your talk kind of with this career that you've had that's mm -hmm. included a lot of international work and foundations and government. Um, and it seems like this is sort of your first time with this leadership position in a university. And I'd be really curious, sort of, what surprised you? What do you see as kind of the real potential for global health impact, um, untapped opportunities, things that you sort of are surprised about um, in terms of challenges? Yeah, I, I was really uh, delighted actually to, uh, 
to meet students. I haven't been in an academic institution. I'm not an academic per se. I've been a federal government employee working for CDC and NIH. So I dealt with scientists and postdocs mostly. But uh, to see students who are coming in, really engaged, wanting to learn, and how much they know. How much, they, how much more they know than I knew when I was their age at that, you know, at that stage. It's just incredible. They have so much information. So try to catch up to that. Understand they actually have much, a much firmer base in terms of their understanding that I could ever appreciate at that same age. So for me, that's something I have to know. I can't approach them in a more functory way. I have to be somewhat sophisticated about what I say, you know, what I look to, and, and drill down a bit more because that's what they want. They want to, you know, tonight I'm giving a lecture on multilateral organizations to the global health uh, certificate, uh, certificate class. I'm being very detailed about what I'm saying. I'm looking at uh, groups that have been funding, have been funded by USA. I'm giving data about the money they've gotten from contracts and grants and cooperative agreements from the government. This is stuff I would never have put in when I was a student. I mean, we're talking you know, light years different. So that to me really was really a surprise. But it's a great, as I said, I'm delighted to see that type of energy and understanding coming from these students. And so we have a lot of work to do as faculty. I mean, to, to be able to give them what they're wanting. In fact, the trauma learning symposium that we just had yesterday, that was driven primarily by students. They want to know about how to work in complex emergencies, how to deal with mental health issues around the world. That's a, as I said, that's not a very strong suit of, of uh, the Gilling School. I think we like to see that happen more, more so, but again, this is what students want. I'm hearing it from them. They want practica, they want to be out in the field, they want to have assignments that they're going to learn something on, not just sort of an edutainment type of a trip. They actually want to learn and, and use the information. So that, I think, is a challenge for me, but it's one that I'm delighted to, to address. Tim, thank you for sharing insights from your career and from your new vantage point. Thanks, Thanks so much. Thanks so much.